And while you're taking your seats, open your Bibles to Math or Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Man, I just love singing that song, All Glory Be to Christ. Is there any way that when, we, at, when I finish, we could sing that one more time to close the service? Is that a yes? Yes, thank you. That would be wonderful. Um, I could sing that at every service. Mark chapter 4, our text for consideration will be verses 26 through 34. One of the most terrifying truths in all of the Bible is this. That God is sovereign. Now you might be sitting here thinking, well, how's that terrifying? It depends on the state of your soul. For the unbeliever, for the one who is not a Christian, that there is a God who knows all things, who rules all things, who reigns over all of creation, that is a terrifying truth. That is why most of atheism is willful and is a suppression of the truth that is in them, Romans chapter one. Now let me give you one of the most comforting truths in all of the scriptures. You ready for it? God is sovereign. What this means is that God is in control. It does not necessarily mean that God just reigns over all things as though we would have this deistic sovereignty where God has set the plan of life in motion and just kind of reigns from a distance. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, we mean his reign over all of the universe, but his rule as well over all things. We are talking about a theistic sovereignty, a God who is intimately and imminently involved in all of his creation. The sovereignty of God is not just the throne that he sits on, but it is the rule and control of all things in life. Reign, rule, control. As R.C. said, as only R.C. could say, if there is one maverick molecule in all of the universe, God is not sovereign. And so for tonight, we are going to look at these parables, and Jesus is giving us parables that show us the perspective of the sovereignty of God in the growth of his kingdom. Follow along with me in verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This ends the reading of the word of God. What we will notice here in these two parables, these are a selection of parables that Mark has compiled together for us. He makes that very clear that Jesus spoke many other things in parables, but Mark makes a special selection and groups about four of these together in chapter four to to give us a sense of the glimpse of the teaching of Jesus and also insight into the kingdom of God. The main point here of both of these, as I had already kind of started out by telling you, is the sovereignty of God over the growth of his kingdom. 
If you were to look back at the first parable that led out this chapter, it's the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is much, it's the perspective of the responsibility of man to respond to the word of God as it is brought to them. The seed is the word. The soil in the parable of the sower is the responsiveness or the types of hearts that receive the word. And you would notice that the final soil, the good soil, hears the word, receives the word, and does something with it. Well, so that we would not be out of balance and under, look at one side and just man's responsibility from that perspective, Jesus here gives us, in a way, kind of peeling back the curtain to show us that ultimately it is the sovereignty of God and the growth of his kingdom. And I want us to notice here in these parables, and first the, fir- the first one of the seed growing, I want us to consider the source of kingdom growth. The source of kingdom growth. And the question we should ask here of verses 26 through 29 is, how does God grow his kingdom? How does God grow his kingdom? And first I would submit to you it is through and by, or it is by gospel proclamation. If you're one who likes alliteration, this is the means of growth. The means of growth is by gospel proclamation. Look again at verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now we know this is parable. And so the man, who does the man represent? No, this man is not Christ in this parable. He's a faithful Christian. This is a faithful Christian who is scattering seed. We know from the parable of the sower, remember, the parable of the sower is the key that unlocks all the parables. And so from the parable of the sower, we recognize that the seed is the word of God. And so what is it that this man is doing in this parable? He is scattering the word of God. He is proclaiming the word of God. What we would notice here is that the advancement and growth of the kingdom of God is directly related to the advancement and spread of the gospel message. Now, in the first century, as the Jews were sitting here and listening to Jesus talk about the secrets of the kingdom of God, everything that they're hearing is quite opposite of what they expected. Now, they're thinking... The king, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to come on the, on, the, on the war horse with the chariots and he's going to usher in this dramatic kingdom revolution. There will be a, there will be a political revolution. There will be a, a, a national revival. There will be a changing. There will be an, overflow, an overthrow of Rome. And Jesus is saying, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on a ground on the ground. And we notice here it is by gospel proclamation. Now gospel proclamation is manifested many ways. When we think of gospel proclamation, we probably visualize a pulpit and a man standing behind a microphone and looking at people and saying repent and believe and that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, and that is absolutely true. It is through preaching. But the gospel is shared in many other ways. That's so limiting to think in that way. Gospel is shared through song. We sing it. Gospel proclamation and presentation is shared through testimony. Everybody who claims to be a Christian has a testimony. You have a BC before Christ. Then you have an AC after Christ. You have a story to tell. Well, I don't know if I... Yes, you do. You do, you have a story to tell. I was once this way, I'm not this way anymore. You don't have to be really, really bad to become really, really good to tell a really, really good story. Jesus has changed my life. I can proclaim the gospel because God has done something to me. I can share this message. Think about the man that was born blind in John chapter 9. How long did he have his testimony? How many years did he wait to build a good testimony before he could get a platform to share it? What did it take him, a day? A couple hours? How did it work out for him? John chapter 9, verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who was born blind. 
And they said to him, this is, this is the, the Pharisees, they say to him, give glory to God. We know that this man, talking of Jesus, is a sinner. And notice this man's testimony. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. I don't have a deep theology. I can't talk to you about the doctrine of the atonement in the way that I, don't, I can't articulate it really well, but this one man can say, something has changed in me. Jesus touched me, and my life is different. He's got a testimony, and he's just testifying of what has happened to him. And so when we think about gospel proclamation, the preaching of the word, and it, we, we, through song we sing the gospel. We share the gospel through our own personal testimonies. Through teaching, one-on-one -on -one sharing and discipling. And so God's means of growing his kingdom is by gospel proclamation. No, it's not by social justice, and this is what the liberals tried to do, to be devastated by World War I and World War II. Protestant liberalism fell because they thought they could do it through humanitarian means of ushering in the kingdom of God. And then your gospel becomes a social gospel which becomes no gospel. But it is through the proclamation and by the proclamation of the gospel that God has ordained the building of his kingdom. This is the means of growth. As if a man should scatter seed on the ground, God uses means sovereignly for his purposes. Now I want to remind you just quickly here, there are two responses to gospel proclamation. And there are only two responses to the proclamation of the gospel. Whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, it is for the hardening of your heart or it is for the softening of your heart. That is it. And according to God's sovereign purposes, both of those things occur. And so every time, whether you are in Christ or you have yet to come to Christ, the gospel proclaimed is to soften our hearts, deepen our love for Christ, our worship and our adoration of God so that we can sing all glory be to Christ and mean it. So as we hear the gospel proclaimed through preaching, through song, through testimony, our hearts are to be molded and softened. So the means of growth for building the kingdom is by gospel proclamation. That's it. Second, it is through spirit regeneration. So the means of growth, gospel proclamation, the mystery of growth. Spirit regeneration. As he speaks of this man here, he, verse 27, he sleeps and rises night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. Now, when understanding the parables, Jesus is talking about things that the first century agricultural ancient or the Near East or Middle Eastern people would totally understand. And so when he gets to this part, and he gets to, the, to this, this sower, this farmer, this is the peculiar part of the parable. What do you mean he doesn't know how his crop grows? He's been at this for a long time. This is what the hearers would say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This is how we can see the main point of the parable right here. He knows not why the seed sprouts and grows. If you were to ask a first century farmer, how, does, how do you grow crops? He would tell you this. He would say, listen, I sowed the seed before the rain season. After I had sowed the seed, I tilled the soil. I went through all of these things to cultivate the correct atmosphere and, 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 and the right climate to, to grow this crops. And then the rains came. I cared for the soil. I made all the conditions perfect and the seed grew. But then why does he say that he knows not how? Or he knows not why? And this is the point that Jesus is making here in verse 27, which is the point of this parable. Because the, the, the man who is scattering the seed recognizes that he is not the cause of the growth. That he is not the cause of the growth. We see here that he is faithful. He sleeps and he rises night and day. He cares for the soil. He cares for the crops. He cares for, for, his, for his lands there. But he is not the cause to make the growth occur. He can cultivate it, but he cannot grow it. 
Now we are talking about the spiritual growth of the kingdom of God, which is manifest physically, we're looking at it right now, but it is a spiritual kingdom that Jesus has ushered in. And this is it, because God is the source of kingdom growth. God himself is sovereign over growing his kingdom through the use of means, but God is the one who causes life. The kingdom is grown through regeneration, through being born again. Think of Jesus' words to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says, don't marvel at what I said to you, that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. There is not one person that belongs to the kingdom of God that has not been born again. To enter the kingdom of God, you must be born twice. I tell my children, just a simple reminder, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. As Jesus would talk, or we would talk about the the second death, the final judgment to be cast into the lake of fire outside of the kingdom of God for all eternity. That is the second death. We will all physically die once. He would tell Nicodemus even earlier in chapter three, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So a necessary prerequisite for Entrance into the kingdom of God is regeneration. This dovetails nicely with this morning of man's total depravity, not utter depravity, as Pastor made it clear. Depraved people can do nice things, but total depravity in our nature and in, 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 in all of our faculties. Total inability. We must be acted upon in order for something to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We know this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So it is neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. The seed that sprouts and grows is the one to whom has been given the eyes to see and the ears to hear. You must be born again. A heart that receives the message and faith to exercise repentance and trust in Jesus Christ. The order of salvation matters. The old reformers would call it the, the ordus salutis, right? And they would look at the order of operations when it comes to salvation. And first and foremost, it is regeneration. We must be born again. New birth precedes new action. Flowing from new birth comes new action. And what is that new action? Repentance and faith. So understand this. The kingdom is grown through the Spirit's regeneration. So what can we apply from even this? You can't save anyone. You've never saved anyone. I've never saved anyone. Yet we can be means that God uses to be used to help people come into the kingdom, but it's not our doing. We might plant, others might water, but it's God who gives growth. So what are we to do? Like the farmer, like this man, this faithful Christian, be faithful. Be faithful for God, by gospel proclamation. Share your testimony. Share what Jesus has been doing, is doing in your life. Point people to him. Spread the word and trust the spirit to work according to his sovereign purpose. I would also add, have calluses on your knees. Pray for the people that you would share the gospel with. And understand that God is sovereign. And God will draw his people. And the greatest blessing that we can have in and of our own lives is that God would be pleased to work through us to accomplish his sovereign purposes. Think about it. The creator of the universe, where heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, would be pleased to use broken, 
redeemed vessels such as ourselves to be conduits of his grace and his message so that others might hear and be brought into the kingdom. Never settle for anything else in life. What great calling upon us as Christians, as ambassadors, as representatives of the king. So the means of growth is by gospel proclamation. The mystery of growth is through the regeneration of the spirit. And now the measure of growth. The measure of growth. We would see in verse 28, the earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. This is our sanctification. This is where we will spend the majority of our life as believers in Jesus Christ. As we are in the kingdom now, the already but not yet, we will spend our lives here. It is by gospel proclamation through regeneration for sanctification. When Jesus says here the earth produces by itself, literally by its own doing, the earth is autonomous in giving forth its growth. It's just a further emphasis lacking, or it's a further emphasis on the lack of human effort in producing growth. You can't make growth happen. So you don't have to dim the lights, change the bulbs, add the smoke, do the thing, all the stuff. You can't make it happen. You can create an environment. You can try to cultivate it all, but you can't make true growth happen. You can, you can move people. You can practice cunning and to tamper with God's word and manipulate, but you can't make true growth happen. So be faithful to God's appointed means of doing that. The proclamation of the gospel. Instead, when we try to make growth happen, we have a bunch of people running around and we call them carnal Christians and we have to do all this stuff and all the numbers get skewed about how many people leave the church and all this stuff. They didn't leave the church. They were never a part of it because of carnal means to try to produce the end because we do not rest in the sovereignty of God. I'm not sorry for that. I'm passionate about it. We must rest in who God is and his appointed means. So God is sovereign over the growth of his kingdom. Notice here the progression in verse 28. The earth produces first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And if you were to think back about the parable of the sower, right? they hear the word, the soil is ripe, and then it begins to grow, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold to each their own measure. Just remember that if any crop, even in the first century, would produce tenfold, that was an enormous crop for the year. So when Jesus says that it produces thirtyfold, that's astronomical. So the growth of the kingdom and the fruit bearing of his people is still a phenomenal thing, no matter what the measure. But here we see this progress of growth. This represents the progress of sanctification in the life of the believer individually, and we see the progressive growth of the kingdom of God. Or a simpler term from progressive sanctification means the process of becoming more like Jesus. That's our goal. That's, that's, that's our mission. That's our, if we were to look at our destination with heaven being our end, as we are progressing towards that goal, it is to be conformed more into the image of his son. This is Romans chapter 8. For those whom he called, he predestined. What's the end of that? That we might be conformed to the image of his son. Becoming more like Jesus daily, progressively as we're going in that direction. Remember, God is sovereign even over this. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you. He began the work in you. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What's the most, one of the most comforting truths in all of the Bible? God is sovereign. What God started in you, God's going to finish it in you. He will hold me fast. This is God's will for your life and for his kingdom. To the Thessalonians, Paul writes, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. We don't arrive at like, I'm pleasing God enough. I'm good. That you do so more and more and more. 
For you know what instructions we gave to you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness. And God does delight in your imperfect obedience as well. Holiness. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. So implied here, even in verse 28, is that the one who has been exposed to the means of growth and experienced the mystery of growth will begin to show forth a measure of growth. You have heard the word. You have received the word. The word is at work in you through the Holy Spirit that has convicted you of sin, that has shown you the beauty of Christ, that has caused you to rely on him. You exercise repentance and faith, and you live a life of repentance and faith. We are to be showing forth a measure of growth. In November of 2020, our little baby Grace went to be with the Lord. She was 14 weeks old in the womb. Her heart was beating. Her hands and feet had been formed. She was about the size of a peach. When Kate went in for that routine Ultrasound check. We had done this four times before, and it, but this was during COVID at the time, and so she has to go in by herself. One of the scariest feelings a mother could ever have. They couldn't find the heartbeat. And it was determined that Grace had died, and as they were seeking to figure out maybe when or where or how, they were able to measure her at her time, and by measuring, they could see when she stopped growing. They were able to give an accurate time frame of when she would have died. It was a sad time for us, and yet we were thankful. We were thankful for grace. We are thankful every day for grace. And the lessons that God taught us through her life, 14 weeks. And as I think about that, and I think about the measure of growth, it makes me evaluate even of my own self, and I think in their case, in that measuring of her, the point is that growth was a sign of life. As it is in us as physical beings, it is in us as spiritual beings. Growth is a sign of life. Growth is a sign of health. When we lack growth, that is a sign of death. In the extreme, in periods of lack of growth, is a sign of something is very, very wrong with you. We are not to plateau in our Christian life. Even worse, we are not to reach a point and turn around and then 10 years later look back in, at a time when we were holier. It, the trajectory is a line graph going up in holiness. This is God's will for our life that we would grow. Romans 8, 13, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. So notice here in this progression, there are three stages that Jesus gives. This is our progress of maturity as Christians. The first one, he says, first, the blade. This is the beginning stages of growth. That little sprout, that little seed that has been on the good soil and has been given life and sprouts up, this is the blade, this is the new believer. Maybe a cage stager, excited, full of zeal, ready to conquer the world. Maybe a post-millennialist, until they calm down, ready to call out the sins of the church and the sins of the nation, but sometimes they fail to see the sins in the mirror. Full of zeal, need to be channeled. The blade grows, the blade becomes an ear, more established, 
growing as a Christian, beginning to think about how they can help others grow as Christians. They start looking at the blades and they remember, I remember being a blade like that. Let me come alongside you. Let me temper you a little bit if I can. Learning more and more with a hunger. They're looking to master the scriptures. Less concerned with what is wrong with everyone else and more concerned about their own personal holiness. Then there's the full grain in the ear. Here's the wise, the seasoned Christian, gentle, slow to speak. This one is no longer looking to master the scriptures, but rather has let the scriptures master them. This is the seasoned disciple maker. This one in this stage of maturity is concerned with gospel proclamation and helping others to do it well. Well acquainted with their own sins and are humbled by them, but not haunted. They know they are great sinners, but they have an even greater Savior. And as they've grown in Christian maturity, their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is ever increasing. And so the point here that we see in this progress of growth in the kingdom is that it is being made up with men and women who are growing in holiness. The unholy kingdom belongs to the kingdom of this world. We have been rescued and saved to be sanctified. So let me ask you, where are you? Where are you in the progress of growth in the kingdom, in Christian maturity? Are you that blade? Young, eager, zealous. Are you that more seasoned ear that has gone through some trials and been humbled along the way? Are you that seasoned saint that has walked long with Jesus and longed to see others Walk with Jesus. God grows his kingdom by gospel proclamation through spirit regeneration for this progressive sanctification. And to what end? To what end? We would say the maturation of growth. So the means, the mystery, the measure, and the maturation of growth until final glorification, verse 29. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. There is a day coming when full maturation of the kingdom of God will be reached. The harvest here, we would notice from other passages of Scripture, as Scripture interprets Scripture, the harvest reminds us and tells us that it is the end of the age. It is when we all reach final glorification. As believers, we long for that day, right? When sin will be no more. When pain and sorrow will cease. When we will behold the Lamb. And we will stand in the presence of Him. And we will worship as we ought. That's not today. But that is final glorification. We will, we will, the, this, this old decrepit body will be gone away with and we will have new bodies without death and decay. The harvest being the end of the age when the kingdom is consummated or we would say completed or made perfect. Individually though, we see this is the completion of the process of kingdom growth in the life of a Christian. This is the end of kingdom growth for individuals. When the grain is ripe, we notice here we have reached full maturity. When we have accomplished God's purpose for our lives, he puts in the sickle. He calls us home. This morning, Bill Swift reached that moment. The grain was ripe. The sickle was laid. And God brought his saint home. And Bill is rejoicing with Jesus. And Bill 
is in the most blissful place, in the most blissful situation he's ever experienced in all of his life. And he would tell you, not for one second, would I ever want to leave this place. And so Bill, that dear saint, the grain is ripe, he has gone on to be with the Lord, and just thinking about him, oh, he left us a legacy of faithfulness. Some of us, we must recognize it because reality tells us this, are closer to that harvest than others. Though we do not know when our day is, but none of us are there yet. Which means God is not done with us yet. When God is done with you, when you've fulfilled your purpose for God in this life, he calls you home. But until then, the question of why am I here, it's because God's not done with you. He's doing a work in you, And hopefully, he's going to be doing a work through you for the advancement of his kingdom. Think about what Paul says of David in Acts 13. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. After David did what he was supposed to do and served God's purposes, he was done. I think of what Count Zinzendorf would say to his missionaries, the great Moravian missions uh, movement of generations and centuries ago. He would tell them, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. That's it. Serve the purpose of God. Do it faithfully. But until that day that he calls us home, we are to labor. We are to scatter the seed. We are to intercede in prayer. We are to toil night and day because we have set our hope upon the living God. And we do so completely trusting in the sovereignty of God and growing his kingdom. Notice here, God is the source of his kingdom growth. And this is important because we must remember, Mark's writing to a Roman audience that is suffering persecution, and they need to be reminded of this. They might be seeing little growth in and around Rome. Persecution's rising up, and they're wondering, what's happening here? And Mark's saying, let me remind you of the words of Jesus. God is sovereignly growing his kingdom. No need to worry. It's the same message for us. God's growing his kingdom. Don't worry. Turn the news off. Stop being so concerned about current events and thinking that, oh man, what's going to happen to the kingdom? God's kingdom is bigger than the United States. Though this nation might fall, God reigns. We can still sing all glory be to Christ for the reign and rule of Christ, no matter what happens to America. Guess what? This is happening in Rome here. And it was just a short time after that Nero started using these Christians to light the road as he would burn them. The persecution would come. Brothers and sisters, God's building his kingdom. Let us not worry. And notice here in the parable of the mustard seed, one from the source of the kingdom to the scope of the kingdom. And Jesus tells this tiny little parable, a scandalous parable. couldn't do good alliteration with this one. I tried and it just had me stumped. So these headings might not be up to your liking, but it is tiny beginnings. Tiny beginnings. In this parable of the mustard seed, here Jesus compares the kingdom of God to what happens to a mustard seed. He doesn't compare the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, but he compares it to what happens to a mustard seed. The smallest of all the seeds of the earth that Mark would record here because most likely his Roman audience needed a little bit of understanding. It is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. This isn't what the original listeners to this parable wanted to hear. This is, again, as I had started earlier and stated, this is the exact opposite of what they were looking for. The kingdom of God was to come by force. Chariots of fire, a mighty angel army. The Messiah was going to come in full armor, 
sword, raise up an army, overthrow Rome, establish the throne of David, sit literally on the throne of David in Jerusalem forever. And what Jesus is saying here is not what you think, and it's never been what you thought. Remember, the king rides a donkey first. Here's the paradox of the kingdom. The king dies to build the kingdom. If you were to put yourself in the listener's shoes for a moment, under Roman rule, these are the covenant people of God. These are the people that would go back to 2 Samuel 7 and say, but God, didn't you make a covenant with David? Where's the covenant? Where's this, where's this promise of this kingdom? You promised a, a king and a land that we would call our own. And what Jesus is saying is the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is here. But it's a gradual growth. It is like a mustard seed that falls into the ground. The battles will be waged not with physical sword, but a spiritual one. The battle will be for the hearts of men and women and children in every generation. The kingdom of God is not going to be in just the first century. It's going to span all of the centuries. The kingdom is visible, but the citizens are all united spiritually. And here's the secret. As he told him in verse 11, you can look back there, to you have been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. Here's the secret to the kingdom. It is an unstoppable force. It is an unstoppable force force because it's God's kingdom grown God's way according to God's sovereign purpose. Think about how it started. Think about how this started. One man. One man with no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. In fact, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. He wasn't born in a palace, but a stable. He was first greeted by shepherds, not nobility. He preached a message of repentance and faith for three years, performing miracles in the sight of many. He gained popularity in his region, but that wasn't bigger than New Jersey. He made this, he made the radical claim that he was the Messiah, one with God. Many radicals have come up throughout all of the years making crazy claims. The Romans thought he was crazy, the Jews a blasphemer. Many followed, but only 12 were close to him. One would sell him out for some silver. Betrayed by a friend and deserted by almost all, the self-proclaimed Savior, Jesus, was beaten crucified and buried in a borrowed tomb. Buried on a Friday and got up and walked out of the tomb on a Sunday. He appears to his disciples and later to 500 people. Commissions his followers to be witnesses to what they have seen concerning his life and the message of the forgiveness of sins. A crucified Jew who claimed to be God and allegedly rose from the dead. That's how the kingdom is going to begin. That's God's secret master plan for all of history. And we can say unequivocally, yes. Absolutely, because it's never what you thought it was. This is only conceived in the mind of God. From a humble, tiny beginning to finally an exponential finish. As he says of this mustard seed, smallest of all the seeds on the earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants. Puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Think about how it started. What did the apostles do? 
What did the apostles do? They didn't get it actually. At the beginning of Acts, they say, now will you restore the kingdom? And it's as though Jesus is like, I'm just going to ignore that. Because I'm going to show you the whole point of all of this, these three years, all of this training that I have done for you. I have lived the gospel. I've preached the gospel. I've pronounced the kingdom is here. And they're like, all right, now is the time we're going to sit on the thrones. And he says, no, that's not what's going to happen. You see, the mustard seed has been planted, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here comes the kingdom unleashed. And so what do they do? Jesus tells them, you will be as a man who scattered seed on the ground. You know not how, but the earth produces by itself. And this kingdom will grow from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. From Jerusalem in 30 AD to North Kingstown, Rhode Island in 2023, the kingdom is growing. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 are saved. In Acts chapter 4, 5,000 are saved. In Acts chapter 5, Luke records, more than, ever, more than ever, believers were added. Luke is saying, I'm done counting. I think, Theophilus, you get the point. This is an exponential growth that's occurring. It started with 12. It started with a few, 120 praying in a room. If you haven't got the point now, this is a phenomenon that is taking place. Acts 6, Luke stops counting. Acts 17, 6 says, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Let's fast forward 2,000 years. There are more Christians alive today than ever in the history of the world. You don't need a theology of defeat. The kingdom is not shrinking. It is estimated that there are almost one billion Christians in the world today. I'm talking about Protestants. And we are among those that are in his kingdom so that's where we presently are. That's where we have been. What's it going to look like when it's over? What's it going to look like at the end? Well, guess what? We have that picture too. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. You go to a college football game, if you're a Big Ten fan, Penn State, Ohio State, those stadiums hold 100,000 people. It is incredible to see that many people gathered in one place. But we can count that. And that'll take your breath away. You cannot conceivably even imagine what John is saying here. There was a multitude that no one could count. There were the elect of all time, the redeemed of Christ in every generation that have ever lived. If we're talking about one billion redeemed people today, take all of human history, put them in this room, and there's not a room that we could think of. There was a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes. Oh, those white robes, that righteousness of Christ, the, the sins have been washed away with palm branches in their hands crying out with a loud voice. I get goosebumps every time I read this. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There is no greater song to be sung. And we're all going to sing that in the same language. Whatever that heavenly language will be. It is the people of God from every tribe, tongue, and nation. It is the mustard seed in full bloom. Brothers and sisters, there's a day that is coming that we join this heavenly throng. The full number of the kingdom will break out in praise in the greatest song ever sung. The mustard seed the mustard plant in full maturity. So, what can we take away from even these parables? The most comforting truth is this. God is sovereign. God is growing his kingdom. Do not lose heart. 
You can look around you and you can see darkness around you. God is growing his kingdom. The kingdom is not shrinking. Nations rise and fall. God's kingdom stands forever. So live with boldness. Live with confidence. Scatter seed. Reject the attitude of cloistering in. Oh no, what's the government going to do to us? What, what are we worried about? We serve a higher king. We are citizens of a higher government. The government will be upon his shoulders. Let's not cloister in and retreat from the kingdom of darkness. Light always overcomes. I have never seen a situation where darkness is, where literally darkness has taken away light. Light always dispels darkness. We are God's kingdom ambassadors to Rhode Island. The church is his kingdom outpost. We are the community of the redeemed. So let us not live defeated. Let us live with boldness. And remember this, we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And this is what our community needs. Sacrificial, bold, confident, courageous Christians who will have calluses on their knees from the time spent in the prayer closet. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm.